So hello to everyone. I'm Fabio Tacone for Brussels, and I have the pleasure to have today for the ISISM chat, Dan Brody from New York. Hello, Dan. Hello, Fabio. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Dan Brody is professor of critical care medicine at Columbia University in New York, and is president-elect in ELSO and chair of the ECMONET. So today we will discuss with Dan about some practical um, questions or challenges for the use of VVF in critical ill patients. So the first question for you, it's a, let's say an easy one then, which are the indication or VV ECMO? Uh, well, the indications for VV ECMO, you know, most people think of VV ECMO as strictly for ARDS, but there are obviously a variety of ways that you can use uh, VV ECMO. A status asthmaticus uh, would be one uh, very nice indication. Um, although, Technically, I would call that CO2 removal or ECOR because that's the primary intention in uh, putting a status asthmaticus patient on if they're not very hypoxemic. Uh, and there are other indications as well, but the main indication is ARDS. And so if you think about uh, why you would put somebody on an ARDS or what the specific indication would be, I would go with the EOLIA trial criteria. Uh, you can also use the criteria from the CSER trial. Uh, but the EOLIA trial, uh, being a, a true randomized trial of ECMO versus no ECMO, is probably the best way to guide us uh, currently in terms of the, the evidence that we have. And so there are three indications uh, in the EOLIA trial. The first uh, is a PDEF ratio uh, of uh, less than 50 for at least three hours. The second is a PDEF ratio less than 80 for at least six hours. So both uh, expressing a degree of uh, hypoxemia as the indication for, for ECMO. And then the third criteria, which is uh, probably the most important criteria, is that you have very stiff lungs. So you're trying to maintain a plateau pressure 32 or less, and yet the pH can't be maintained above 725 with a PCO2 uh, less than 60. Uh, and that's despite maximizing the respiratory rate to 35. So if the patient has very stiff lungs, regardless of the degree of hypoxemia, although in Eolia, the median was around 105 or so in those patients, uh, then that, is, that turns out to be the criteria, at least post hoc, that was associated with the best outcomes. But most patients are put on because of hypoxemia, PDF ratio less than 80. I have, of course, an additional question. Do you consider these patients eligible for ECMO when there is a, a failure of another rescue therapy? For example, in Europe, it would be prone positioning. Should yeah. this be included into the definition of a, let's say, refractory RDS? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think it's, a, it's probably the most important point is that ECMO is not an early therapy in the algorithm for ARDS. Uh, within the algorithm, uh, typically, obviously, treat the underlying disease. If the patient has pneumonia, we put them on ECMO without antibiotics. That would not go so well. Uh, you, you want to do lung protective ventilation, uh, as you know, uh, done in the ARDSNET ARMA trial, the, the EXPRESS trial, something that lowers volumes and pressures to the standard of care. Um, and then, you know, if you can diurese them, terrific. It depends on their hemodynamic status. But at that point, if their PDF ratio is less than 150 in the algorithm, you really want to think first and foremost about prone positioning. And I think things have changed a lot in recent, uh, uh, in this last year, really because of COVID, where in the lung safe study, only 16% of patients with a PDF ratio less than 100 received prone positioning uh, in an international uh, cohort. Uh, now I think we're seeing uh, a lot more frequent use and uh, it is really becoming the standard across the world where it has been in many European countries for some time. So I agree with you completely. I think you mentioned an important point, which is lung mechanics. And um, some people consider that ECMO, of course, is considered as a rescue therapy, but could become earlier in the management of RDS to uh, allow uh, protective lung ventilation. So it's more in the moderate RDS. Do you think that we have a space for that in the future? We need more trials. There is already some data to discuss about this issue. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's a very... Uh, it's a topic of great interest, and I think uh, we, we will for sure see more data. And in fact, uh, the REST trial, which was uh, recently completed, was stopped early uh, by uh, uh, James McNamee and Danny McCauley from uh, Belfast uh, under the uh, National Health Service in the UK. Uh, those, those results will be coming out soon, uh, and it was presented already. And so the, uh, the uh, final result is that it was a negative trial and no, under those specific conditions. Uh, and of course, there are many ways that it can be done. And so I don't think that that puts the question to rest, but it should certainly uh, give us pause uh, in thinking about it as a current indication. I think it remains a research uh, 
indication of great interest, but not something that we would do uh, going forward. And as you say, the, the idea is simply that by being able to remove carbon dioxide directly from the, uh, from the blood, we have the ability to, uh, to decrease uh, ventilation uh, even more than the standard of care under the arts and armor trial. Uh, and so we can lower volumes, pressures, and even respiratory rate to a level that may cause less ventilator induced lung injury. And so it's very appealing in theory, but of course uh, that has to be weighed against the complications of ECMO or ECOR. Uh, and uh, also uh, we have to figure out what's the best way to ventilate uh, if we uh, simply shut off the lungs that may or may not be uh, appropriate for the patient. So a lot left to be learned, certainly more trials to come, but I think it is, uh, remains a very appealing concept. I thank you for your response because you introduced my next question, which is, of course, we decided to put the patients on ECMO, but we are still, of course, very, uh, uh, we want to protect the lungs. And so the question would be how you set up the ventilator of the patients on ECMO. Would you go for a very protective lung, lung, protective lung ventilation? Would you try to open the lung as soon as possible? And whatever is the strategy you would that you use, do you think that the mode of ventilation matters? control volume ventilation, control pressure ventilation, a PRV, which are your thoughts? So uh, here we have much less uh, data to guide us. <clears throat> so I think it, there, there are many right answers. Um, the one wrong answer is to put somebody on uh, VB ECMO for ARDS specifically and not decrease the volumes and pressures at all to remain on uh, sort of higher pressures uh, that may be injurious to the lungs. So some uh, form of doing that uh, should be acceptable. If we go strictly by the current evidence we have, um, the two best trials that we have are Eolia and Caesar, and using the, uh, the uh, ventilation modes that they use would be perfectly reasonable and in fact, probably the best answers that we have. So typically we follow uh, something close to the Eolia trial where the total pressure uh, was kept at 24 or less. So less than 25 uh, centimeters of water. Um, most of the patients in the Eolia trial were uh, ventilated with the volume control, uh, assist control, volume control mode. Um, there were uh, a few with pressure control and APRV uh, with uh, uh, APRV in the French style was, uh, was allowed, although not that many patients uh, were on that. All of those, as long as you maintain those pressures, uh, you know, uh, at a relatively low rate uh, or relatively low number is, is uh, reasonable. And in that setting, the PEEP was maintained. And this is very typical. Uh, if you look at the lifeguard study and others, uh, by that, that one by Matthew Schmidt, uh, 10 to 15, some, something you know, in the range of moderate PEEP for such severe ARDS patients uh, is typically maintained, which means the driving pressure uh, remains relatively low compared to what it uh, is often in these patients before they go on ECMO. Uh, the respiratory rate in the Eolia trial was 10 to 30. I think if we were to redesign it today, we would uh, decrease that. And so typically in our center, we have a respiratory rate below 10. Um, and in fact, we often try to get the total pressure below 20, although uh, that's often with incredibly low uh, tidal volumes. So, and the answer to that is not, is not known. Uh, and how long you should do that is not known. Uh, I think these are uh, really uh, important questions that we're gonna have to explore uh, going forward. Um, you introduced uh, the concept also of uncertainty about many things that we do during ECMO therapy. If you want to choose, let's say, one pragmatic intervention, hemoglobin, transfusions, uh, sedation, oxygen levels during VV ECMO, which one do you would like to study in a randomized clinical trial? If you want to pick one, which would be your, your, your optimal one, your best one? So I want to pick 20, but I will pick one for you. And... Uh, I think the, one of the burning questions that we have relates to what we were just talking about, which is you know, if you're gonna impose uh, very low volume, low pressure ventilation uh, or sort of ultra protective ventilation on patients uh, that typically will require, not always, but typically requires deep sedation and sometimes uh, use of neuromuscular blockade. And so we have to ask ourselves, how long should we do that? Is that the best strategy? Um, is protecting the lungs from ventilator induced lung injury more important than being able to wake the patient up, potentially even extubate them during ECMO uh, and do early mobilization. Uh, and you know, somewhere in there, there's, there's a turning point where we all start to do that, but, but where is that? And so there are a number of protocols being developed now that I think are very forward thinking. Um, it's not exactly clear how to design those protocols uh, because I don't, there's still a lot of information that we need, uh, but there are some very clever ways of approaching this. And I think I, I recently inspired by a, a very nice, 
uh, letter to uh, JAMA Surgery by a group in Chicago uh, where they took their COVID patients and they were able to wake them up uh, and extubate them typically at around 11 to 12 days uh, and then uh, do physical therapy in the COVID patients on ECMO. And they had very good outcomes. Um, very difficult to tease out why they had such good outcomes because they used a bundle of interventions, but they did something very well. And so I think that's uh, increased the interest in uh, studying this approach to uh, ECMO. And of, of the 20 or 30 questions that I think are burning, that, that's probably the most interesting one. Last the challenging issue, at least for today, would be what happens to patients who remain hypoxemic during VV ECMO. Do you consider we should talk about refractory hypoxemia or refractory hypoxia? Uh, so there are sort of several questions uh, in that one question. Uh, the first is, you know, what is the uh, our target for either PaO2 or, uh, or oxygen saturation during ECMO. And that's been a very big controversy for many years. In the end, I, I think I agree with the, what, what you're insinuating in your question, which is that we should care about high, tissue hypoxia and not hypoxemia. It's oxygen delivery that, that always matters. And so if, the, if there's no evidence of tissue hypoxia, then a low level of oxygen saturation uh, is uh, should not in and of itself be an indication to do something differently. It can be very difficult to maintain uh, normal oxygen saturation during ECMO in a patient with a high cardiac output, particularly uh, ARDS with sepsis. And so we should not chase a number, but look at the patient and see what their actual needs are. And then, of course, uh, if there is evidence of uh, tissue hypoxia, then uh, we should do something to try to ameliorate that and improve the oxygenation. Uh, so then I really have to thank you because in these 12 minutes we had the, the chance to discuss with you with the, some, of course we cannot discuss about everything, some controversies or uh, relevant issues that are uh, uh, often discussed about VV patients ECMO. So I thank you again for your participation and I hope to have you soon for next chat. All right. Thank you very much, Fabio. Bye-bye.